welcome to Halloween Blockbusters. <laughs> this is our second uh, episode of the month, and we're continuing our Halloween theme. I am your host, Joe Halloween, and once again, I'm joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew Walker. Andrew Halloween. All Junior. right. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I'm Joe's nephew, everybody. <laughs> I'm surprised, Joe, you didn't bust out at some Vincent Price. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's uh, I mean, there are stable. copyright rules, but yeah. Yeah. I love his little bit in the uh, Thriller song. That's uh, that's always cool to hear his voice. Um, so how are you guys enjoying the spooky season so far? We're about halfway through October. I love it. I love every day. I'm trying to watch a different horror movie every night now. Yeah? I've gone yeah. through a bunch already. That's awesome. Uh, the leaves yeah. are at their absolute peak right now. As I was out and about today, I'm just looking at the trees going, wow. God, I love it's Michigan. It's so amazing, and uh, it's so fleeting because it's like a week ago they were mostly green. This week they're red and orange and yellow, and next week they'll probably be gone. Um, so I try to enjoy it while it lasts, and, and I really love it. Every neighborhood has their Halloween decorations up. Oh, Incredible yeah. Some people go all oh, wow. yeah. yeah. My neighborhood looks amazing. <laughs> Every time I drive, there are people that are putting up the Michael Myers at the, at the corner of their house, the full-size figurine with the knife out. Yeah. And uh, the creepy ring girl, the girl from the movie The Ring. Yeah. And they have, like, fake uh, tombstones. It's They go, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned when I drive through my neighborhood. I'm like, guys, this is a, is this real fog? I've seen some cool cosplay where, like, You'll see a TV, and then a girl, like, climbs out of the TV. And I'm like, that's awesome, man. That's really cool. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I love this time of the year. Uh, earlier, um, before this podcast, like, like Orion had their Halloween extravaganza. They brought back the children's Halloween parade. So there were, had to have been a 1,000 kids out there marching down the street. And then all the stores uh, were giving out candy for trick-or-treaters and stuff. And it was Ooh. just so cool to see. It was that small-town feel where the kids are in costume, the leaves are changing, the stores are handing out candy. It was like something out of a movie. It was really cool. Nice. That's where you get to do a voiceover. <laughs> this looks like small town Americana. You'd never imagine that there was a terror in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween night. Uh, so today's topic, our second Halloween episode of October, um, we're going to talk about movie monsters. Yes. Uh, about a month or so ago, I was at the new Barnes and Noble here in Lake Orion, and I saw in the uh, discount book section a, a large, oversized coffee table book called Movie Monsters, uh, written by uh, John Landis, the movie director. And it was on sale for like twenty bucks, so I picked it up and uh, brought it home and flipped through it. It was really awesome. It kind of recapped the whole history of movie monsters and cinema and stuff like that. So I thought that'd be a great topic for a podcast is to talk about movie monsters. Now, the movie studio that really kind of cemented the image of movie monsters was Universal Studios. Yes. Back when MGM was doing musicals and Fox was doing, uh, you know, period pictures or whatever, uh, Universal was doing the the monster movies and you know, I grew up on, uh, I think it was Saturday afternoons with Sir Graves Gatsley, and he used to uh, show a classic monster movie. Most of them were universal films, uh, but he was a dra- like a vampire Dracula type character who would come out of a coffin, and he would say, you know, this week's feature is Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah. And it was Sir Graves Gatsley who introduced me to all these classic universal movie monsters. It was a... Great time to be a kid and watch those. Yeah, I can imagine. But don't ask my sister because every time he came on, she would run out of the room and, and terror. She couldn't stand Sir Graves Gasly. Was 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 he a local, uh, like a, a local guy? Oh, your mic's cutting yeah, in. Yeah, I can switch I can. over to mic four there. Let's see if that makes a difference. Uh technical problems. Hello, hello. There, oh, yeah, sounds good. Oh, there's your radio voice. Right there's there. my radio voice. Yeah, he now, was uh, local. Um, he would come in from Cleveland every week to do an episode of uh, Sir Graves Gasly. And, uh, yeah, he was the local guy and made public appearances. I never saw him in person. I wish I could have seen him in person. They but, did yeah, a parody of him in Gremlins too. Oh, did they? Really? Yeah, there's like a, a guy who's dressed like a uh, – uh, runs Vampire. like a kid's – horror show he's just like a uh, dracula yeah and he says this is my time to be a real r- reporter and he starts interviewing the gremlins 
Well, the cool thing about like the 70s and 80s is like every community in America, every major city in America had some sort of local horror movie host. Right. right. We had two, actually. One was out of Canada, I believe. The Ghoul uh, was like TV 20 at midnight. And I, normally I wasn't allowed to stay up and watch it. But occasionally if I would hang out with my cousins or whatever, we'd turn on The Ghoul and watch The Ghoul. So we had Sir Graves. We had The Ghoul. Um, but other communities had, you know, Elvira and all sorts of cool uh, uh, monster movie hosts. It was a great, great time. That was really neat. Even uh, Fright Night kind of poked fun of it with Vincent. Um, yeah, yeah, with um, oh, know, the character's catching name. me off. Guard. I just watched well, that Vincent um, the other night yeah. too for the first time. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would host the horror movie show Fright Night, yeah. uh, and uh, and then they the Charlie comes to him for assistance in battling a vampire. Fright and, Night. And uh, yeah, God, that's we'll, we'll talk about yeah. Fright Night a little bit more later on. It's one of my all time favorite. Yeah, movies. but I love I, I I miss those shows where yeah. they used to have a host dedicated strictly to to horror. I wonder if I could make a comeback. Yeah, locally there was a guy who really gave it a, a good run. He had a show on TV twenty for a while. His name was Wolfman Mac. And uh, the actor who played him was Mac Kelly. And we even brought Mac into the TV studio here to do some Halloween specials and stuff. And he would go full Wolfman makeup and, you know, his voice would get really raspy. And ow, and he, he was just awesome. And while he had his show on TV 20, he would get just enough sponsorships to, like, keep it going. But never really turned him into a major celebrity or a millionaire. But he was a great guy. And the character was a lot of fun. And. I don't know if he does it anymore. Maybe special appearances every once in a while, but I'll I'll find him. Yeah, I could at least have him on my show to interview. Yeah, oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you could track him down, you could bring him in. Yeah, he's. It was great uh, having the the Wolfman uh, uh, horror movie host, and he would show old you know public domain movies and stuff like that. So, all right. So what I was thinking of doing, uh, at least for you know maybe the first hour or so of the podcast is I'm going to rattle off some uh, classic movie monsters, and we're going to kind of go around the table and talk about some of our favorite movies that uh, feature that particular monster. Sure. And the first one I wanted to start off with, uh, you know, we kind of snuck them in uh, at the beginning of the show here, was, uh, you know, the Wolfman, the werewolf character. Um, staple, you know, we got to go all the way back to Lon Chaney Jr. in those early days of the Universal films. Yep. Uh, they would have that the device where he would, you know, the moon. It's funny, throughout a Wolfman movie, the moon would get full about four or five times during the film, even though <laughs> you yeah. only get one full moon a month. But in the movies, you got three or four of them yeah. within a span of an hour and a half. But what they would do with Lon Chaney Jr. is he would fall in a certain position where he was able to hold his head and hand still. And they would apply fur and fangs and makeup, and they would apply a little bit and roll some film and apply some more and roll some film. And then they would do dissolves to kind of show the transition. Yeah. And uh, I just watched uh, uh, just this past weekend, uh, Abbott and Costello uh, meet Frankenstein. And the title is a little misleading because we get Frankenstein, Wolfman, Dracula, uh, and even the Invisible Man makes a little cameo, I guess you can call it, at the end of the film. Uh, but they did the same thing where Lon Chaney Jr. would fall like onto a tree trunk and it would kind of hold his hands and head in place while they applied the makeup. Um, but that movie is so much fun because it has some, if you're a kid watching this movie, there's some genuine scares in the movie, but it's laugh out loud funny. Yeah. And that's, you know, some of my favorite horror movies are, are movies that incorporate humor. And so Abbott and, Cos Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein had, you know, it's three of the classic uh, horror characters, but in that case, they brought back some of the original actors that played them. Did you know in, in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, uh, Bella Lugosi played Dracula only for the second time. The first time was in Dracula. Yeah. The second time was in this Abbott and Costello movie, and he never played Dracula again. It was those two appearances. Uh, but you so closely yeah. associate him with Dracula. I would have thought more than that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Now he played other horror movie characters, you know, in other movies, but he only played Dracula those two times. And oh. they were probably, gosh, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years apart doing those two roles. Because your two most iconic people are Bela Lugosi and Christopher Lee. Yeah, as yeah. Dracula, sure. Yeah. yeah. 
And then Lon Chaney Jr., you know, he played Wolfman in the Universal film. He came back and uh, played him in the Abbott and Costello movie. And I think he played the Wolfman in some other movies because I had read that one of the the last Wolfman movie that he did before doing the Abbott and Costello movie, he gets cured. Somehow he gets cured of his curse. And then he shows up in the Abbott and Costello movie and they they never explain, yeah. you know, why are Although you a werewolf again? In the 1941 movie, wasn't that... Uh, Did he die in that one? Or? Yeah, I could have sworn. Cause, uh, That's a good question. I'm not because sure. Because his dad was, uh, oh my God, Louis from uh, Casablanca. My God, I'm drawing Claude, a blank on. Yeah, Claude, Claude Rains. Rains. Yeah, Claude Rains played his, uh, played his father. I don't remember that. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to revisit that. Maybe that's uh, this week, and I'll pop in some of those classic Universal monsters. Because that's movies. the one where it's, it's the classic line where the, where the gypsy goes, Go, and may heaven help you. <laughs> You're mad. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know what. I mean, obviously, when a movie's successful, they find a way to bring a character back, yeah. whether he died at the end of it or not. Um, but yeah, so Lon Chaney Jr. Um, gained fame as playing uh, the Wolfman. He played some other um, monsters, too. As a matter of fact, he was one of several actors that played Frankenstein. The interesting thing about Frankenstein in the Abbott and Costello movie, the titular character, um, is that they approached Boris Karloff, and he didn't want to do it. And I don't remember what his reasons were. I don't know if he just didn't want to play the character again because he came back later in the Abbott and Costello movies and did Boris Karloff, uh, or Abbott and Costello meet Boris Karloff. Uh, the killer, you know, that sort of thing. Hmm. Um, so he did do Abbott and Costello movies, but for some reason he didn't reprise his classic Frankenstein character, which is kind of sad because it would have been cool to have uh, Lon Chaney, Bela Lugosi, and Boris Karloff all in the same movie. That was yeah. a missed opportunity. So they got an actor named Glenn Strange, who I think had played Frankenstein in one or two films before the Abbott and Costello movie, and he did a great job. I mean, it was a lot of fun. But it was really cool seeing those three monsters on screen at the same time. So the gold standard is the Wolfman, and then Abbott and Costello meet uh, Frankenstein. Um, as far as more modern werewolf movies, a couple that come to mind uh, that I grew up with, especially in the 80s, is when movies were still doing practical effects. We didn't have the digital effects yet. And there were makeup artists like Tom Savini and Rick Baker, who would do these werewolf transformation scenes, and they always seemed to try and outdo each other. Yeah. Each movie that came out in the 80s tried to outdo the previous movie, and it was so much fun seeing a person transform into a werewolf. One that comes to mind is The Howling. There's an amazing, amazing werewolf transformation yes. sequence in that. Um, and I was surprised when I watched it again recently you ever watch a movie where you recognize an act, or you don't know an actor when you first see it, and then when you watch it years and years later, you go, oh, I know that dude. Robert Picardo, who was the holographic doctor on, uh, I think, Voyager, one of the Star yeah. Trek series, he was the werewolf character in The Howling, and I'm like, oh, yeah, look at him. Uh, but that's an amazing werewolf transformation sequence. Probably one of the most famous werewolf transformation the sequences gold standard. Is, is the American Werewolf in yeah. London. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny, like, um, the actor who, uh, what's his name? Uh, David, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Um, but like, he'll just be either sleeping or, you know, just talking and all of a sudden he'll just go, ah, like he'll scream like the The transformation, uh, process begins. David Naughton is what I was thinking of. The transformation process begins and he conveys it as being so painful. Like his, he is in agony turning into this werewolf. And they show, you know, his face, like the snout emerge from his face. That's not something spot. kids should watch if you're oh, not ready. <laughs> it's, but unless you want your kid to be yeah. like an effects guy, because these are like classes in horror effects. Like, and they would do different stages, and his feet would elongate, and his fingers would, and his spine, and his ears would, you know, point. The part where he stood oh. a human head and his body had already changed yeah and he's staring down at his body in, in horror yeah i mean yes that's... <laughs> it's such an amazing transformation scene and apparently you know i always look up trivia when i watch movies now and uh he was the uh david naughton was the dr pepper spokesperson at the time and because what? yeah i'm a pepper you're a pepper what oh you my like god that was david naughton and uh, apparently they dropped him because of this movie because he had 
full frontal nudity scenes in American <laughs> Werewolf in London. And they're like, we don't want people to drink our product and think of your <laughs> dong. So, yeah, they kind of dropped them. But what it was, it's a great, <laughs> entertaining movie. And the transformation scenes are That was amazing. Landis. What's that? Wasn't that Landis? American Werewolf in London? I believe it was. John Landis. Yeah, yeah the guy who inspired this podcast. Yeah. Um, so those are two that immediately come to mind. Um, just before the podcast, we were talking about how uh, I recently rewatched, gosh, probably in 30 years, uh, Wolf starring Jack Nicholson. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is I, I didn't have much memories of, of seeing it, but I was looking up uh, like highest grossing movies in the 90s. And, and this Wolf movie was right up there for like the entire year. It was one of the top grossing movies of the year. It came out like 93, 94, something like that. It didn't make sense. Yeah. That part didn't make sense. But then I thought back and I said, okay, it kind of does because of, for me, Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> well, and, and Jack Nicholson, you know, he was at the top of his craft uh, at that time. And so I decided, you know, it was such a, a huge blockbuster. I said, the American public can't be wrong. So I, I watched it. Uh, I think I rented it on Apple Plus or something. And uh, it was very, very entertaining. And not, not for the horror aspect of it, but what was cool about it is that it was a different take on the werewolf trope. You know, in most werewolf movies, every time the moon goes full, they turn into a wolf and kill a bunch of people. In this particular movie, what they the little twist that they did is he gets bitten by a wolf at the beginning of the film, and it's revealed throughout the film that he's slowly turning into a wolf form at the end of the transformation and will permanently be a wolf yeah. at the end of the movie. And I'm like, well, that's a different twist on the werewolf trope that he's actually they're showing him he's gaining the characteristics and the stamina of a wolf and he slowly he gets his hair back he he has a line in the movie where he's like i'm i'm not just the president i'm also a member of the hair club for men because he's getting his hair back and uh it was an interesting take and like you said michelle pfeiffer is the love interest in there even though i think their ages were about 20 years apart uh, that's a whole nother podcast that we could talk about. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Michelle Pfeiffer was at her absolute peak. Jack Nicholson was great. The writing was great. There were some really good lines and dialogue that in the third movie. act though. Yeah. So, so at the end of the movie, you know, the, 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 you find out that the rival, the, the bad guy in this film, uh, he was bit by Jack Nicholson midway through the movie, even though they didn't make it real clear that he had been bitten. Um, and then you realize that he's also turning into a werewolf. So now you got these two great actors and partial werewolf makeup, you know, having this long drawn out fight scene. And that's where the movie falls apart a little bit. Not only that, he was, uh, my man was in the, the, in the police station. He was already looking really wolfy. I goes, is yeah. anyone paying attention to that? All he had the contact lenses. Yeah. And, the and, fur yeah. too. And like, he's. His, yeah, his eyes are bugged out. I'm like, that's yeah. those aren't normal eyes. <laughs> no one picked up on that. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, you guys, none of you guys thought that weird. Now, have Andrew, um, have you seen Wolf? I haven't. You've seen it. Yes. I, 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 I hate to spoil this for anyone because I really encourage you, and I, I really don't think this ruins the movie for anybody. But I want to discuss the ending, ending, the very end of the film. Uh after Jack Nicholson kind of runs away, the police are on the grounds because the, the villain had gotten killed and everything. And all of a sudden, Michelle Pfeiffer's acting very odd. Yeah. And her sense of smell is heightened. And her she eyes. can hear them talking uh, way far away. She like turned and said, I can hear what you're saying or whatever. And she had the contact lenses in. So people are like, okay, what happened here at the end of the movie? Was she a wolf all along, or did something happen along the uh, way with Jack Nicholson that, where she became infected? I think it's is, the latter. Well, here's someone brought up this theory, and I thought this was really intriguing, that the movie almost depicts the, the what is it, ly lycanthropy, am yeah. I pronouncing that correctly, as a transmittable disease, 
And those two had, uh, you know, a little sexy scene in the hotel room that he was staying at. Sure. So was the lycanthropy transferred to her through a sex uh, moment? And I'm like, that's really intriguing. That's pretty oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. yeah, no, that's true. That, yeah. Uh, that's entirely possible. Because they never established that she was bitten or anything. And some people kind of theorize that maybe she was the wolf that attacked him at the very beginning of the movie. But I don't buy that because... The, the full form wolf is the end result of yeah. the transformation where it seems like she was just beginning her transformation. So I'm like, that's kind of interesting in, in an era where, you know, communicable, uh, communicable, I don't know, diseases yeah. Tra- yeah. Yeah, that this movie was almost sort of an analogy for transmitting diseases at the time. And I'm like, it's kind of an interesting take that she may have gotten that through sex. So, I don't know. Watch Wolf, and uh, I'd be curious to hear what your take is on the uh, the end. What other werewolf movies come to mind? For me, I, one of my classic ones is Silver Bullet with Stephen oh, King. Oh, that's a good one. You know, it's uh, some of the stuff is a little bit campy, but I enjoy it. Gary Busey's fantastic in that movie. I Corey think it's Hines. one of his best roles ever. Yeah. Loved it. Uncle Red. You know, <laughs> there's a scene in there where where uh, the – Marty's sister, or uh, she plays when her voiceovers as as, as a grown up. Yeah, she's narrating. Yeah, the movie, she's yeah. narrating, and she talks about there was an old uh, weaponsmith, and and I love the guy, the old man who plays him. He goes, yeah, I mean, what would you need a silver bullet for? <laughs> How about a killer werewolf? <laughs> and he just says, and uh, Gary Busey just kind of stares at him. I'm like, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. No, I I I love that movie. Um, yeah, I love when Gary Busey's character and the sister. You know, they think that uh, the, uh, what's his name? Uh, What was the kid's name in the wheelchair? Marty. Marty. What's the actor that played him? Corey Heim, I think. One of the Corys, that's right. Um, He he was so amazing in this film. And, you know, he's trying to convince everybody what he's seen, and, and, uh, and they're dismissing him as, you know, being crazy. And I love the moments where they start to buy into it, where they start going, okay, maybe you're on to something. And um, I love the movie. The biggest weakness of that particular film is the werewolf itself. And I remember when I was reading some trivia about the film that for, I don't know if it was for budget overruns or what, but they kind of skimped on the werewolf. Yeah, You never really see the werewolf walking and moving. It's always very kind of stationary where maybe you just see the head or whatever. And you can kind of tell that they skimped a little bit when it came to the to the werewolf. If, if they were to use those same you know, transforming techniques that they use in those other movies that we were talking about, Silver Bullet would rank right up there with yeah. those films. So that's the only weakness is is the werewolf in the film. But the storyline is great. The big reveal of, you know, who the villain is in the film, that was really amazing. And, uh, yeah, definitely, for me, <coughs> top five werewolf movies of all time. Yeah. And, um, I, I love The Howling. And uh, another movie that I recently discovered uh, maybe in the last couple of years is a movie called howl in 2015 i think it was a british movie Hmm. so the the gist of it is that this this commuter train is going between two towns and in the spooky part of the woods in in the in the wilderness it hits a deer has to stop the conductor gets out or the engineer gets out to look gets killed because they're surrounded by werewolves and so it's basically this all these passengers have to survive the night so they can get to daylight before they can get the hell out of there because they're about two miles away from the nearest station. And it's kind of like, what you, Andrew, when you're saying like the, the setting is in one location, it kind of amps up to I, yeah. I only I stumble upon it because the YouTube algorithm mm. g- said, oh, you're kind of a weirdo <laughs> for wolf movie, so you might enjoy this. I said, oh, how about that? All right. I might have to check that one out. Yeah, I'm always Howl, looking just for call stuff Howl, I haven't seen before. 2015. Andrew, can you think of any other werewolf movies we're missing out? I, I had a... A hard time. I was flipping through all all the recommendations for <laughs> werewolf movies, and I had not seen. The only one I had seen is an American Werewolf in Paris. Oh, that was the out. sequel. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen. I watched sequel. that on. Yeah, I watched it on VHS right when it came out. I was probably thirteen or fourteen, at a friend's house when I was spending the night, and it was cool when you're that age. Yeah, but looking, if I were to watch it now, I I can't imagine that I'd really like it i was reading about it earlier and i'm like oh yeah this doesn't sound very good <laughs> um but no surprisingly i just have whatever reason i've never seen anything i mean there might have been 
the Ab- Abbott Costello movie that you were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. It was on playing when I was a kid, but I didn't ever really stop and like watch the whole thing at once. Same thing with Underworld. Like that was playing at probably mm-hmm. like a party in college or something, but right, right. never stopped to actually watch it. So, all right, yeah, yeah. A couple I mean, of weeks. I, I know, I know, a couple of weeks. You I mean, there's some up. good diamond in the roughs. Like how? Like I, 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 that would never have made my list. Yeah, just four years ago. Uh, so with werewolf movies, it's really difficult because you got to find the right atmosphere for it. Uh, it's not like vampires and, and the other thing, it, and it's really difficult to tell werewolf movies. I don't know why they struggle with it. When Benicio del Toro was doing that remake of Wolfman, yeah, when it's one of the more recent. I, ones, I was yeah. actually excited because I saw the cast. It was Emily Blunt, Anthony Hopkins. I said, "Oh, you know, Hugo Weaving." Like, okay, well, let's see. Then the date got moved. Uh oh, yeah. red flag number one. Yep. Yep. Rewrites. Red flag number two. And then I saw it, and they had this idea that they were going for, and then for some reason they let computer effects take over. They get they turn into it always veers into action. And I and that's like the biggest downfall for most of these horror movies. It, it's like Wolf. Yeah. Wolf was doing fun. Then they said, okay, the third the third act has to be completely action. Yeah. Just and and it, it and it it saps the tension, the horror that they spent all this time setting up because somebody trying to make a blockbuster. This is Hollywood blockbusters, and this is what it'll do. Let's make it an action schlock, and it it, it loses the whole yeah thread of it. You know, when you mentioned uh, com- computer animation transformation, it made me think of another movie that pops the mind that, or popped into my head that m- you might not consider a werewolf movie, but it has a really great movie werewolf in it, and that is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, they introduced Professor Lupine, I think that's his name, which is a clue of what he is. And this is called Lupin. Uh, Lupin, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so Lupin is a variation on Wolf, and so you know they they kind of tip their hand uh, early on in the film, and then I mean it is a kids book. I was like, I wonder who's the werewolf. <laughs> I don't know the guy named Lupin. <laughs> Be a good place That's to right. start. But that was a really great story about this professor who you know kind of is there to uh, protect Harry, and uh, but then he has this you know this problem that he can't control and. Uh, it was a really good take on, uh, you know, the Wolfman uh, mythology uh, working into that film. It was a lot of fun. And, and, I appreciate uh, the, the, the depth that J.K. did. Her storytelling, on the other hand, is just, that's the one night you forget, dude, your whole life you've been very aware <laughs> of the full moon, the night Harry needs help. Whoops, yeah. forgot to take his serum. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, yeah. No, that was a lot of fun. But, you know, you mentioned the, the computer animation. When you compare a, a modern Wolfman movie that uses computer animation to do the transformation versus those 80s old school practical effects, there's no comparison. Like, it's too easy to use a computer to take a human and turn him into a wolf. And it comes across on screen like it, it, there's no horror to it. There's no terror to it. It's just, it's almost like watching a cartoon, yeah, I guess. just flat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when but when you see those practical effects in the 70s and 80s, it's terrifying. It's really terrifying to see that transformation. To their credit, Wolfman tried that because I think they they Benicio del Toro looked like he was agonizing as he was mm. changing. They tried that, but it's still depending on how you do it. I, I, again, nothing will compare to Landis's American World from London. Yeah, where you thought, my God, you can hear the bones snapping. From oh, this exactly. Guy. Yeah, like it, it was, was so crucial. painful. Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. All right, so that kind of covers uh, werewolves. Let's move on to probably the most common uh, movie monster, and that's uh, the vampire. Uh, I mean, you could probably rattle off 100 vampire movies. Oh, yeah. So, uh, of course, going back to the Golden Age and Universal and all that, uh, Bella, Bella Lugosi was the standard. He had played him on stage. That accent was his accent. He brought that to the role um, and he really nailed it as Dracula in the you know nineteen what thirty something yeah. uh, movie Dracula, and that was the model that everyone sort of emulated. Over time, people tried to do various twists on the the vampire theme, like you know Nosferatu had, had the very creepy you know Max and, Shrek. Uh, yeah, 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 and they're going to be doing that remake this Christmas. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on yeah, Christmas for Nosferatu. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Great marketing, guys. <laughs> um, so yeah, so people kind of take that vampire theme and do some different things. Um, my all-time favorite vamp- vampire movie 
and we'll probably talk about it again on our next podcast because <coughs> it's one of my all-time favorite horror movies in general, is the 1985 version of Fright Night. Yes. What I love about it, I remember going to the theater uh, when I was about a teenager. I was probably, what, 19 when that came out. And a group of friends of mine and I went to the movie theater. We had seen, you know, the trailer on TV, but didn't really know much about it. Go to the theater and right off the bat, like within minutes of the movie starting, you see them like carrying this coffin into the house next door. (laughs) And you're like, man, they're just really getting to it. They're like just dismissing any setup. Like, okay, this vampire is moving in next door. Let's get that out of the way. Boom, let's go. And again, the humor and the genuine scares. And uh, it's one of my all-time favorite movies, man. I, I came out of that theater, like, hyperventilating. Like, that was terrifying. It was funny. It was great. Uh, Christopher Sarandon uh, as Jerry Dandridge yeah. just brought something new to the role. Like, he would always be seen eating fruit for some reason. And I looked into that. Like, why, why would a vampire be eating fruit? And someone said, well, you have heard of a fruit bat, haven't you? And I'm like, wow, that's that's genius. That's pretty good. So they incorporated that. And then... Uh, a wonderful actor. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he did such a great job as the villain. And, and um, Roddy McDowell plays the horror movie host yeah. of Vincent. And uh, it's just, uh, just a really unique original take on the vampire story. Uh, when he takes uh, Amy, uh, you know, and takes her and she starts transforming into a vampire. And that scene where she's she's like blaming Charlie for everything that happened to her. And he starts getting kind of really sad. And then she turns around with that horrific smile, the big yeah. toothy smile. I remember literally like jumping in my chair like, oh, my God. And so it had some genuine uh, scares to it. And uh over the last few years, I've actually had a chance to meet most of the actors that were in the movie. Started out with Chris Sarandon at Motor City Comic Con. And then uh, a few years ago, uh, one of the local horror cons, I forget which one it was, uh, had William Ragsdale, who played Charlie, and Amanda Bierce, who played Amy. They were both there together. And I got to meet both of them at the same time. And then about a year or so later, uh, uh, evil Ed, uh, Stephen Jeffries, uh, showed up at a local horror con and, and it was oh. also like talk, it was awesome talking to him about the role and, and the lines that people ask him to say, you know, like mm, mm, the dinner's in the oven, you know, and just <laughs> stuff like that. And, oh, you're so cool, Brewster. And just so many great lines. And, uh, yeah, it's the it's, master's going to kill you. <laughs> slowly oh so slowly um great great movie and then of course you know after establishing that you know fright night is this tv show that vincent peter vincent that's his name peter vincent uh host when jerry dandridge comes out uh the upper level and he goes welcome to fright night and there's that pause and he goes for real ah that's such a great moment such a great line and you see that movie, and again, somebody said, you know what, let's make a remake of that. And they focused more on getting a cast, which was Colin Farrell yeah. and David Tennant, and, oh, the late, great um, the actor that passed away, he played Chekhov in the new uh, Star Trek. Oh, uh, Anton Yelchin? Yeah. Anton Yelchin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and it's just, you watch that, and you go, I don't know if they, ca- they, they took the wrong lessons of it. Yeah. They completely ruined the Peter Vincent character, like they wasted David Tennant in that role. Yeah. When I heard David Tennant was nice, I said, this is going to be great. Colin Farrell did his best to be a good Jerry, but it's not, it's not Jerry. Yeah. No. I, I didn't see the movie out of protest because I love the movie so much. When, when they remade, you know, classic 80 films like RoboCop and stuff like that, I just stayed away. I'm like, those are classics. Those are beloved cl- classics. Don't remake those. So I avoided that film. I never actually saw Fright Night 2, even though that apparently has a following. I don't know. Uh, I, I want to say that William Ragsdale may have returned for Fright Night 2. Yeah, um, I wasn't a big fan of it. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't re- I don't think I've ever sat down and watched that from beginning to end. But the first one's a classic. And, and for me, when Halloween rolls around, Fright Night is like 
you know, watching, say, It's a Wonderful Life at Christmas time. Yeah. Fright Night is that movie I love watching every year, this time of the year. It's just, to me, has become a, a classic, a standard that I watch over and over and over again. So that's my all-time favorite uh, vampire movie. Uh, not too long ago, I think about a year ago, I rewatched for the first time in a long time The Lost Boys. Yes. Another classic 80s film that funny, has a some... huge following. Great cast, amazing cast, and uh, I really, really enjoyed that. It was so 80s. Yeah. It's just a like time capsule, you know, of the 80s, so it was really I fun. I don't think you could remake that. No. I, I, I wonder if they tried. I hope they didn't. If no. they did, I, I didn't pay attention to it, but, yeah, that'd be very difficult to remake now. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun revisiting that for the first time in a long time. I forgot how much I enjoyed that film. Uh, what other vampire movies uh, come to mind? For me, I have those. Um, I'm on the top of my list, but some I have some very recent additions that I'm a huge fan of. Mm-hmm. Uh, Abigail was a movie that came out very recently in the last year or two. I don't know that one. I haven't seen that one. It's a very simple concept. This crew kidnaps this girl. And she's supposed to be the daughter of some mob boss or, or a wealthy person. And they're supposed to keep her at this one hideout. And then they find out that it's this very dangerous war, you know, criminal. Uh, uh, turns out Abigail is a vampire. Mm. And she's the daughter of a very powerful vampire. So this gang of thieves are stuck in a house with this vampire and they have to survive. Mm. And it's it's. So the tables are turned. Yeah. And it's really well done. I enjoy I mean. If you get a chance to check it out, it's great performances. I, 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 I love that movie. And a movie that I did not expect to like. And I, when, it, when I like a movie that I didn't expect to like, I, I embrace it even more. Voyage of the Demeter. <laughs> I never heard of that one either. It came out in the last year or two. It's basically the Demeter that in Bram Stoker's Dracula that brought Dracula from the, the, the old country to London. And follows the. I'm sorry, I'm crunching a halls right now. <laughs> it's on my. It's on my teeth breaking, but uh, it it was so well done because if you get a chance to watch it, it's it it, it contributes to the lore. I'm surprised if they wanted to make a sequel from that movie, and take one of the main characters and just add him to trying to find Van Helsing and stop the scourge of Dracula. It's really great. It it was a true horror movie. It's not oh Dracula's Mrs. Mina and it's. Oh, my heart sank. I'm this uh, tragic hero. No, Dracula is a freaking monster. Hmm. Interesting. And he plays. So they, do they strip the whole romantic? Yeah. Uh, wow. Oh no. And, and this this Dracula is. I mean, if there was a compassionate side to him, it's long gone. Like this <laughs> this this version. What you, when the audience is in, introduced to him, he is the devil incarnate. Hmm. I mean, this man, this thing. It, if you get a chance, and again. Close setting. It's be, it's yes. the voyage of the Demeter. Yeah, yeah. When they load the coffin from the huh. moment it starts to the ending. There, there's a little trope in the end where I was say when the, when the hero goes, it's the monster, and he he goes running after the monster. I'm like, what what are you doing? <laughs> I, I, sometimes uh, no movie's perfect. They always have one little thing where yeah. they could accomplish the same thing. He just stood at the window and went, oh, there he there it is. <laughs> Whenever they do, I'm like, what, and what happens when you catch him? Yeah. You got me thinking about the old Sinbad routine where he said if he's getting chased by Dracula and there's somebody running yeah. with him, he's going to trip that guy and go, Drac, get him. And he takes so I was saying, if you're, if you're a woman and you're with me and Dracula, you're a dead woman. She would be damned. And tri- tripping like she's got five sisters, five big ones. Or was that Simpsons line where Homer says, uh, don't kill me. I have a family. Kill them. Yeah. Uh, but now when you were talking about Abigail, you got me thinking about another vampire movie that I really, really enjoyed. Now, this is a an American remake of a Japanese film. The Japanese film is called Let the Right One In, I think. Is called. Oh, no. Yeah, it's a Swedish yeah. film. Is it Swedish? It I thought Swedish it was Japanese. Film. So that was Chloe, Let the Chloe Right Mor- One In. Chloe Grace Moretz. So she, she was in the yeah. remake called yeah. Let Me In. Yeah. Mm. And I saw that for the first time a few years ago, and I, I, I really love her as an actress, but that movie is fantastic. Yes. It You know, it, it gets away from the trope of the male vampire where now you have this female vampire who befriends uh, a boy her age or whatever, and it is fantastic. Definitely worth seeing. I, I've come across it uh recently 
just searching for new horror movies to watch. Um, but I didn't know anything about it. But yeah. you recommend it? Oh, big time! Okay. I own it. Yeah, I have. Uh, I have a uh, have it in my collection at home. All right. Yeah. You got any Dracula vampire yeah, movies you want to recommend? Uh, yeah, I just watched Fright Night for the first time a couple nights ago, and it's one of those movies I I wish I would have seen you know before, but no, I can see why you like it, Joe, and I I really yeah. like it too. I, I would like to watch it again because I was, you know how you get sometimes you're you're on your phone doing stuff that you have to catch up on that you didn't get to yeah. do early in the day um and didn't get to pay attention as much as i wanted to but no i really liked it uh, especially the the guy who was the tv host and he helps me oh real yeah life. i thought that was cool so yeah, what you, so what you're great. describing is you netflix watched them uh, is yeah. that what we all do <laughs> <laughs> next ne, ne, that's the netflix watch where you you're it's on but i'm looking at my phone or doing something i'm reading and then, netflix and chill yeah <laughs> what else you um, got i have three others on the list Movie that I liked, but I haven't seen in a long time, is from Dust Till Dawn. Yeah, oh. that's, that's an interesting one. Yeah, like I remember, I remember when I saw that for the first time. Like I was really intrigued at the beginning because it was kind of like a sort of a crime, you yeah, know, with George film Clooney and, and Tarantino. And then it yeah. takes the batshit yeah. crazy <laughs> twist, and I'm like, "What is happening here?" It didn't even give me a chance to enjoy it. Like I was like I watching <laughs> Selma Hayek at the time. Like, my God, this is fantastic! Oh my goodness, <laughs> what the <laughs> hell? A snake? Yeah, yeah. I need to revisit uh, that one. Also, around the same time, I think, uh, Blade. Blade? Blade was later. Blade was about- Like uh, two years, three yeah, years Yeah, two or three years yeah. later. Blade, Blade's fantastic. But there's I, another uh, interesting twist on the yeah. vampire tropes is making him the butt-kicking hero. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. One of the best openings. Um, in, in the uh, club? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> creepy. Um. I saw the first two. I didn't see the third one. I heard it was No, you don't have to. Don't worry was about good. it. It's good. They always refer to the Blade trilogy and Yeah, uh, you kind of have to, but uh, it's it's, you know, it's like the Alien trilogy. It's Alien Aliens, don't worry about it. Is it is it uh okay to talk about uh Deadpool and Wolverine spoilers? Do you think enough time has passed? Sure. I think it has that? because they've sure. already because the actual Blade movie in the MCU is in trouble right now. Yeah. And because oh, they yeah. think because Deadpool Wolverine they think they should give the set give it back to right yeah and that well, i was going to refer to the one line where he's like only one guy is yeah. you know blade and everyone's like uh should we tell him i thought that was a really <laughs> funny line that was great but go ahead um and then another movie that was actually filmed here in detroit it came out 10 years ago anyone alice and eve no never not, heard no. That. not as follows star that's not a no vampire movie, also but. came out 10 years ago excellent movie Filmed right down the street from where I work. Um, <laughs> this stars Tom Hiddleston and yeah, I thought that was that wasn't, Kate, that wasn't Kate, Al- Kate oh Blanchett. Oh no, the movie wasn't. They played it like Alice and Eve characters. It, that was the the hint of it. Yeah, Tilda Swinton and uh, you mean Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve. Sorry, yeah, not Alice. Adam and Eve. Um, what's it called? It's called. Have you seen it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's it's called the Only Lovers Left yes. Alive. <laughs> You're making that up. I no. have never. Never even heard of that. So it was filmed here in Detroit back, huh. I think, when we still had the tax credits and uh, filmed like an old dilapidated house. And they've been around for at least, what, 600 years, maybe longer? Oh, yeah. They're centuries old. Yeah. yeah. The characters. Huh. Yeah. No Tom idea. Hiddleston, uh, Cape. No, not Cape Land. Tilda Swinton. Tilda Swinton. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and then most, a lot of it takes place in Detroit. They're. Someone is entering a like a hospital to get blood, right? And then what's yeah. his name is there? Um, uh, Jeffrey Rush. Yeah, Jeffrey Rush is in the hospital. Anyway, and then it takes some of it takes place in like Morocco. Yeah, it's a very it's it's, 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 it's strange. It's a it's an interesting take on these two characters have been around for so long, and it's just how how are they getting adjusted to life? That's one of the things about vampires because they're scary, but sometimes you wonder about I've. It's it's like the the latest with the interview the vampire TV series. They, mm. It does a great job exploring what does a vampire do with immortality. Right, and so Tom Hiddleston's character, he's like a musician. He's got all these guitars from the last you know hundreds of years. <laughs> um, it's very artsy. It's very indie. Um, it's not for everybody, but I haven't watched that in forever. I need to watch that again. But huh, really cool. Very different take on it. Mm-hmm. It kind of explores the. 
decay of Detroit, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, really, really cool. Interesting. Yeah. Now you mentioned um, uh, the title of a movie, and I want to talk about a couple of movies that seems to have gotten a lot of critical acclaim. But I tried watching them, and I just can't get into them. One of them is Interview with a Vampire. I just don't care for that movie at all. The other one is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Like that was such a a huge phenomenon when it came out to the point where the Simpsons parodied it, parodied it, and everything. I've never gotten into those two movies. I I sat down, I watched them. I just about had to force myself to stay awake to watch them. Uh, Do not care for either one of those. Do you guys like either one I, of those movies? I haven't seen either one. Neither one. I yeah. I, I I I watched both movies. I thought uh, the Interview with the Vampire movie was it was. They tried to capture some of what Anne Rice had written. I think the TV series that's just come out is infinitely better. Oh, interesting. Okay. Like exponentially better if, if you get a chance to see it. Uh, regarding Bram Stoker's Dracula, when I first heard it was coming out, I said, okay, this is going to be great. Read the book, loved the novel. Keanu Reeves and... <laughs> and <laughs> Miscast, and, you think? Oh, my God. And Winona Ryder. I'm like, what is this? Like, what are we doing? Anthony Hopkins, Gary Oldman was fantastic in it. Damn. And... They they kept trying to, they never settle on something. It, it, it's like okay, he's this tragic hero, but is it a horror movie? And they kind of lose the 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 train of thought. Like Van Helsing goes off the rails a little bit. Hmm. He's like she's the whore of the devil, and then, uh, you know, he starts doing like weird. He's like, are you trying to be seduced by Mina? It's like weird. Uh, it, Coppola, when, when I can see some of Megapolis in it. Yeah, so, yeah. Like I see the 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 seeds of Megapolis. Yeah, where it's like this is my pa- my 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 just, passion, my vanity it felt project. Very pretentious to me, and I don't know. I I, I want my vampires a little bit more fun, <laughs> I guess. All right, any other vampire movies before we move on to our next monster? Twilight. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? I noticed you wearing glitter. I, I thought you were gonna. Bring I, I will it up. say this: if they ever get a chance to do it properly, uh, you mentioned Blade, mm, the yeah. second Blade. The second Blade was a great. Uh, Guillermo del Toro, it gave rise to a, a novel that he, co- uh, a novel series they co-wrote with Chuck Hogan called The Strain. They turned it into a TV series. Right, right. The, the, the audio book, the book, the novels are great. Ron Perlman does the narration for the audio book, the first one. It is absolutely fantastic. If you want to mm-hmm. listen to it at night, I, re- I recommend that you do. You probably won't sleep. What, what are the uh, Kate Beckinsale movies? What are those? Underworld. Underworld. Is she, is she a vampire in those? Yeah, yeah. Or does she fight vampires? She is a vampire. She's a vampire. You guys, I've never seen a one of those. Have you guys seen it? Those? Ha- it had lore, but it turned into an action schlock. Yeah, that's what yeah, I figured. It, it, like I, I said earlier, like it was on in the background when I was at parties and stuff, and I never really, it never interested me at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could do it's beautiful, but yeah, we yeah. could do an entire podcast on how Universal just can't seem to get the damn engine to start on this. You know what? You're you're reading my mind because I wanted to segue into that a little bit later about how, you know, Universal became famous for these monster movies and they own the rights to all these classic monsters and they've tried to sort of relaunch them, but all the modern sort of re-releases of these classic Universal monsters all seem to tank for some reason. Man, how do you mess that up? I would say it's poor leadership. And the reason I say that is because... Universal passed on Star Wars. Universal passed on Harry Potter. Mm. <laughs> Universal passed on Lord of the Rings. So yeah. you're sitting there going, what have you guys done? Warner Brothers is like, oh, we passed on Lord of the Rings? Pick up Harry Potter. Yeah, yeah. Problem solved. Okay, we don't look like complete asses right now. Universal says, oh, you know what? I'll tell you what. We're going to <laughs> relaunch our horror series, yeah. and we got Hugh Jackman to play Van Helsing. We don't need your under- Harry Potter. We got our own mm-hmm. line And it's going to be a characters. new franchise with Van with Hugh Jackman <laughs> as Van Helsing. It's coming in 2004, <gasps> and we're waiting for the right story. And my God, that movie was a train wreck. <laughs> you watch it because it's so it's like the so William sad. Hung of horror movies. <laughs> like, yeah, I heard it was bad because they put uh, oh it has the it has the werewolf the Wolfman in it. It has Frankenstein in it. It has Dracula in it. Yeah. What's Dracula trying to do? I want to have a family. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what is this? And the acting was so over the top. Like That's Kate Beckinsale's hysterical. in it, and wow, she puts this Eastern, like Romanian, Transylvanian accent. I'm like, Kate, you're. Mm. This is not your finest performance. All right. All right. Let's move on to. Frankenstein's monster. Now, we can't just say Frankenstein because that's not the monster. Right. That's the guy who created the monster. And that's, you always hear people discuss that. Frankenstein is not the monster. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, I think in the Abbott Costello movie, they go to great lengths to not call him Frankenstein. He is Frankenstein's monster. Now, of course, Bar- Boris Karloff gave birth uh, to the character on film. Uh, was it uh, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, right? And a lot of people credit her with with creating the the birth of um, smart or sci-fi and right. uh, sci-fi horror and that sort of stuff. Even though she doesn't really give the get the credit she deserves, um, so she created Frankenstein. Uh, they do the uh, they do the movie with Bo- Boris Karloff, which is an absolute classic. Uh, and then, you know, people have tried to recreate that with relative degrees of success uh, since then. Can you guys think of any modern takes? Uh, I know there was a Robert De Niro film where he played Frankenstein. That was a relatively recent film. I never saw that. I know I know. Aaron Eckhart did one. It was I, Frankenstein or something. It was okay. very weird. Frankenstein yeah, it looked the, bad. Fra- Frankenstein's the one monster I... I, I <laughs> I can't seem to like wrap my head around it. Yeah. Meaning that okay, this doctor it was the doc the Frankenstein Doctor Frankenstein is the monster. Mm-hmm. He's the one that's trying to. I don't blame Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, he's just a helpless yeah, yeah he, victim. You know, yeah, he's a victim in all this. I, it's Doctor Frankenstein's the one that's toying with you know the laws of nature and everything like that. And anytime I, I think of Frankenstein, my head immediately goes to young, young Frankenstein. I can't. It goes to comedy. And <laughs> that, I, that arguably could be the greatest. Frankenstein movie ever made. Yeah. That is such a great movie. And, and you know, the interesting thing about that is apparently Mel Brooks used the original uh, lab equipment and set pieces that were in the original, yeah. you know, universal horror films. So there's this authenticity. It's black and white. And uh, Gene Wilder just, he plays, he doesn't play it like he's in a comedy. He's playing it as if he's in a, you know, a classic horror movie. And that's what makes him so great in it as a mad scientist, you know. The 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 cast and the delivery of the comedy that that is um, that's one of those textbook examples. If you're ever get teaching comedy, you put Young Frankenstein on. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It kind of gets a little nuts at the end when they're, when they're like performing, putting on the ribs yeah. at the end of the movie. That's so <laughs> crazy. Up until that point, Mel can It's like note for note borrowing from the classic Universal monster. Mel loves his musicals. Blazing Saddles at the end is the huge <laughs> musical at the end that breaks That's the right. fourth wall. <laughs> um, can't escape it. Now, you know what's funny is not until fairly recently, and I want to say within the last few years, I sat down and watched Bride of Frankenstein with Elsa Lanchester as the bride. And a lot of people prefer the Bride of Frankenstein over the original Frankenstein. And it's a pretty darn entertaining movie. And, you know, there's that classic moment. And maybe I just relate to this too much. But when they bring the Bride of Frankenstein to life and she gets a load of Frankenstein's monster and, like, lets out a scream. And he's like, (laughs) I'm like, you know, I could relate to that. I've, I went on a couple of love at AOL dates where it kind of <laughs> went the same way. Where they're like, you don't look like your picture. So I, I don't know. Maybe I can relate to that. But definitely, Bride of Frankenstein is worth checking out. It's it's definitely a classic. I'm sure there's some good Frankenstein movies out there. Andrew, you probably have unearthed them. You're you're probably the best of this one. Like Andrew will find the ones. He's like a ranger. Like, he won't see the mainstream stuff, but he'll go yeah. find like. I found a Lithuanian movie <laughs> made in 1972. You guys I, will love it. I, a very early memory of mine is um, when when I, we my my family we lived in Pontiac. Um, there was this small like mom and pop video store on the corner that we would always rent movies from. And my dad said, "Andrew, would, would you like to see a really old scary movie?" And we rented the 1931 Frankenstein, the original. And the the one scene that sticks out to me because it really did scare me. I was probably like six or seven was when he's playing that game with the girl and she's throwing the 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 flowers in the water. Yeah. And he picks her up and throws her in. Yeah. And then the look on his face and then what happens to him afterwards when they, you know, try to kill him, that scared the crap out of me. Yeah. As I, it it was like real to me, you know, because when you're that small, you don't, you know, movies are real. Um, so yeah, yeah, classic that, moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I really, that's burning my brain. Um, Frankenstein movies. Besides that, though, yeah, course, there's like I, we just talked about. Uh, anytime they try to revisit it, it just yeah. doesn't quite 
work because he's know? a sympathetic character yeah. at its core like in any iteration it's all it's always like the doctor trying to bring him back the doctor's the one that's messing with he's like not the, out trying to kill people like dracula or yeah, yeah. predator <laughs> yeah <laughs> because because he's unnatural and because he doesn't know any better you know and then the townspeople will turn on him i mean it's a little bit of social commentary sure but it's difficult to get scared of it yeah it's, but think about the audience you know in the 30s when frankenstein came out the concept of digging up bodies, assembling them, injecting them with electricity, and bringing them back to life had to have been so horrific for that audience. Seeing that movie yeah. for the first time, like I can imagine sitting in that theater watching that movie for the first time and having your stomach turn, like knowing that Frankenstein's <laughs> monster is a collection of body parts brought back to life. Man, that had to have been so horrific. It seems almost quaint today because we we went through the slasher era and we become desensitized to a lot of that stuff but back then that audience must have been like yeah. just so repulsed by the concept of bringing a dead body back to life i i had never made this connection i'm 40 years old and just now making this connection that edward scissorhands is a frankenstein movie you're kind of right right yeah 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 i'm trying to remember how how he was stitched together right like Vincent Price's character gave him yeah, life. Yeah, gave him life. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm trying. Why did he give? Why did he give him scissors for hands? I don't remember that. I part. don't remember why. I'm gonna have to revisit that film too. It's been but, a while. But you know that family kind of brings him in. And yeah, yeah. Like the original Frankenstein, he's kind of like a child. Like, yeah. You know, mentally. and when he accidentally hurts somebody, the townspeople right. turn yeah. on him. I yeah. just put that together. Interesting. <laughs> Look at that. And when, See? The, when the creepy lady tries to seduce him, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> okay, lady, this is. Yeah. yeah, and he's so innocent, like you said, and yeah. almost beautiful. Like it's just this innocence. It's a good movie. I need and to Winona revisit. Ryder yeah. played the same character that she did in Bram Stoker's Dracula. There you go. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. If we think of Next any other, we'll come mad. back to it. But <laughs> just so angry at that. And I love Winona Ryder. She's played great yeah. roles in oh, other. It just, Beetlejuice. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was just why in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I don't know if it was a year ago, but probably within the past year. I sat down to revisit a movie. I think this is from the 90s. You know, I'm going, folks, I'm going without notes here today. So I'm just. <laughs> this going is off amazing, the top. everybody. This so is I'm like, having a hard time recalling years and actors' names and stuff. But Joe's it's, flying it's the plane. He's like, I have no GPS. I'm, yeah, I'm just I'm, flying I'm through just, the storm. I'm visually, I'm not using instruments, man. I'm flying by sight. Um, but I watched a, I believe it's a 90s movie uh, just recently. I hadn't seen it in a long, long time. And I remember thinking, Damn it, this is a good movie. This is so entertaining. And I'm talking about The Mummy with Brendan Fraser. Yes. Rewatching that again for the first time in a long time. It it's it's an adrenaline rush because there's a lot going on. Um, but my goodness, you know, we here we were just talking about how Universal uh, has a hard time capturing the magic of its original movie monsters, but you know, they did the mummy back in the the golden age of uh Universal monster <laughs> movies and you know, that Boris Karloff movie it was really good. I think it's one of the better universal uh, monster yes. movies. Um, what's interesting in that one, we'll come back to the Brendan Fraser in a second, but what's interesting about the Boris Karloff version is we only see him as the mummy within the first few minutes of the movie. And then they, they I think they read an incantation that has him come out of his sarcoph sarcophagus. He grabs that scroll or whatever and leaves. And then we never see him as the mummy Again, and that's such an iconic character that wrapped in bandages mummy. Throughout the rest of the film, we see him as, uh, I forget the character's name, uh, Imhotep or I don't know. I can't remember what his character's name was the rest of the film, but he has like the fez and like those card off sunken cheeks and stuff. And we see him as that character the rest of the film. And it's actually a really, really good film. Um, but that was one of the movies. I don't. Not only did they get right with the Brendan Fraser, Fraser version, but I think they actually improved on it, where it became this swashbuckling action flick with romance and uh, uh, what's what's the female lead in uh, Rachel Wise? Oh my God, she was really. I think that was one of her first role. major roles. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. And their chemistry was just fantastic with her accent and everything, and um, they really got that right. Now. I remember watching The Mummy 2. That's where they introduced the Scorpion King, right, with The yeah. Rock. And some people say that the computer generation 
Scorpion <laughs> King is one of the worst computer generated effects in the history of movies. And I've seen people try to use the, uh, uh, the capture where they try to put images of the rock on the Scorpion King to try and improve those effects. Cause they're pretty awful. And so, that's universal. You have, yeah. you have the scratch to not do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was pretty bad, but, uh, I, 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 I really love that first one. It was just almost not quite on par with Indiana Jones, but very close second. Like that character. It, sh- it's an adventure story. Yeah. I yeah. like that. It's not so much horror. Is it, uh, there's some horror elements, but it's more yeah. of an adventure story. And I enjoyed that. They, yeah. they really leaned into it. Uh, but typical universal, they tried to do a remake. Came out in, I think, 2017, 2018. It was supposed to be the launch. Oh, the Tom dark. Cruise one? You looked oh, awful. My With God. the dark universe, this was supposed to be. And this is why they can't get it right. Yeah, that's the one they botched. Yeah, They're like, oh, they had, they, they had Johnny Depp cast. They're like, oh, we have all these characters. We're going to launch. You know, it's, This is going to start the whole dark universe. Yeah. It's rocking a hot 15% on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> I just looked it up. Oh, no. It looked awful. Oh, I wasn't going to see it. You know, and, and look, the Mummy series, I actually... The Mummy 2, again, started veering more into action, so I was like, all right. But the Mummy, the original Mummy, 19, not the original, but the 1999 Mummy, I yeah, I loved it. Yeah. I'll watch anytime that comes on there. I think that's on my top 100 list. I I've still it. never seen it. I have never seen it. Brendan Fraser Mummy. I've never seen it. God, you've got to <laughs> sit down and watch that movie. In, he does a great job. I know everyone, everyone loves it. Yeah. And, yeah. and you made an excellent point, Joe. That's the closest... I, now, when you when you said it right now to to Indiana Jones, it is it, like it that vibe that he has heavily from okay. Indiana Jones, but it works. It takes elements. I mean, I think he even has like a brown leather jacket on. Uh, they take elements from Indiana Jones, but they make it their own, and that's what a good homage does: is yep. you take familiar elements, but you make something new with it, and that's what the mummy is. It's like, why did you kiss me? I don't know. I was about to get. I was about to die. <laughs> Seem a good thing to do at the time. Like, oh, she gets so flustered. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. It's really, really. Can good. you swim if the if the situation calls for it? Trust me, it calls for it. <laughs> Pitches her off the boat. <laughs> you know, just like those are the elements. Like you, you enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. Now another. Uh, I don't think there's many mummy movies we can talk about, so we're going to move on to uh, the sea creature. Uh, my probably my favorite uh, original Universal monster movie was Creature from the Black Lagoon. That came. That was one of the last Universal monster movies uh, that was done. I think in the fifties, and I think it's one of the best. And like Frankenstein, um, the creature was just minding his own business. The white man comes into <laughs> his swampy territory and bother him, and then he's the bad guy. What's the deal with that? <laughs> um, and so you know, he's just the creature being the creature, and then. They capture him and bring him back, you know, to mainland or whatever. And I'm like, leave the guy alone. It so had it had a King Kong vibe. There. Yeah, mm-hmm. Kong yeah, money is busy. You're exactly right. Yeah, it <laughs> does. Universe. Definitely has that King Kong vibe. And so I think that's why, you know, as a kid watching Creature from the Black Lagoon on Sir Graves Gatsby, I sympathized with the with the creature. He wasn't necessarily the bad guy. He was yanked out of his element and uh, and was forced to deal with it. And I absolutely love that movie. And then when you want to talk about a modern retelling of that particular, uh, you know, I hate to use this, uh, fish out of water, pardon the pun. Um, but Couldn't help yourself. imagine watching Creature from the Black Lagoon and saying, hmm, what would happen if the creature actually got the girl? <laughs> and that's exactly what... Fish uh, in the water. Benicio, uh, the Shape of Water. Shape of Water. Yeah, what's shape of what's water. the director's name? Uh, Guillermo del Toro. Guillermo del Toro. I was going to say Benicio del Toro. <laughs> um, Guillermo did the exact same thing. He watched Creature from the Black Lagoon, sympathized with the creature, and thought, what if the creature gets the girl? And I saw this movie in the theater, The Shape of Water, and absolutely loved it. Just thought it was fantastic. And what it, did people protest? The fish sticks. The what? <laughs> the, the, oh, the, the intimacy. <laughs> like, really, that's your takeaway, everybody? That's that's what we're going to focus on? Fair enough. I thought you said fish sticks. I'm like, I, I thought you said fish thing. eggs. No, no. <laughs> no, no. All right. Yeah, I remember when the one woman was asking the one, how do you guys do it? And she was describing <laughs> that there's a pouch or something. I don't know. But <laughs> I, I, 
love the movie, but I never thought in a million years it would win the Best Picture Oscar, and it did. It won the Oscar for Best Picture, and I'm sure there are a lot of people saying, what? Yeah. That I movie. Remember- I but remember people said that. Yeah. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I thought it was a great modern you. take on the creature from the black. Thank you to Peter Jackson for finally having anything that's fantasy, <laughs> sci fi is finally kicking down the door. <laughs> I mean, stick, Star Wars got nominated, sure, in 1977. But yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. God forbid. One. God forbid anything fun or funny gets an Oscar. It's very <laughs> rare that you know, something like I, that. I want to give a tip of the head since we're talking about uh, sea creatures. I want to give a little tip of the hat uh, uh, to um, Monster Squad, another movie's in the 80s. You know, it, I was waiting to bring that up because I wanted to cover Wolfman, Dracula, Mummy, Creature, because all of those monsters yes. appear in Monster Squad. And have you seen Monster Squad? Monster Squad does such a great job of, I mean, they, they put their own spin on each character. Sure. They're not doing Bella Lugosi and stuff, but... They take those characters, put them all in one movie, and have the Goonies basically yeah. uh, going doing battle with the the monsters. It is a classic. I revisited it a number of years ago and just love the movie. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, has, I think that's his number one favorite movie of all time. Um, the guy but who plays yeah. the Wolfman did a great job. That scene in the phone booth when he's like, "He's going to kill your son." Like, Whoa! <laughs> and the classic line, uh, "Kick him in the nards. nards." Does the Wolfman have nards? <laughs> and they kick him. Oh, the Wolfman has nards. And to anyone, who, to the people who watched it, they'll probably agree with me. Rudy and Horace <laughs> do all the work. <laughs> Everybody else is just spectators. Rudy and Horace did all the work. When you get when you, if you watch the movie, you'll know what I mean by that. I've been uh, seeing a lot of posts on Facebook. Apparently, m- the, most of the living cast members have been getting together at various horror cons, and you can meet the entire cast That'd be all awesome. in one sitting. And people have had, I'm seeing pictures of Monster Squad movie posters with Dracula and Wolfman and Mummy all signing the poster. And I'm like, that's really cool to see mm-hmm. all of them in one one room under one roof. Um, but if you have not seen Monster Squad, that is must-see Hall- Halloween movie material it is a lot of fun it's i gosh i'm gonna get some flack for saying this i like it better than goonies uh i find it enormously entertaining you're venturing into very dangerous waters <laughs> there joe i want i want to go out with there i want to go out there with you but i, I just yeah. i just flash back to our slasher episode as i looked in nick's eyes and gave me his <laughs> look. No, I'm, I'm just like can i go out on that limb that far like no nah, that limb's gonna snap I know Goonies is a classic. It's just kind of loud for me, but uh, but Monster Squad is definitely you, you made know, me cut think. from the same cloth. That, that wasn't an easy decision for me. I had to. Get, I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I love movies that bring uh, the, you know multiple movie monsters together. Uh, like I said, Abbott and Monster and Squad did it better than Universal. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's now, the shameful who part. Did, I'm curious. You guys got your phone out. Who did Monster Squad? Because I want to say, with all those characters appearing in the same film, was Monster Squad a Universal film or I not? I almost feel like it would have to be. Yeah, to be able to use all of those I think Universal is like, oh, and... really? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, do it. Yeah, it's yeah. It's 80s. Yeah, we don't care. But, no. Uh, it but... says it was released by TriStar. Huh, interesting. The film features pastiches of the Universal Monsters. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. But, yeah, definitely check that out. Um, you know, you mentioned Van Helsing where they try to put uh, all the monsters on screen oh. at the same time, but you said that one particularly uh, failed miserably. It makes my brain cry when I when I think about that movie because they they hyped it up. They said we're only going to do this when we get all the creatures together. It's going to be a franchise. It's going to expand everything. I was like, oh wow, and you, okay, let's see what you got. And then, <laughs> I mean, that ship, that Titanic sank right in the dock. <laughs> I have a quick question because mm-hmm. I'm I'm not. Maybe you guys know. Was the Invisible Man part of Universal? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that I actually watched that for the first time. I think it was last Halloween. Uh, Claude Rains is in it. It's one of their early but uh, it, Universal. But is he horror? I uh, think the, the closest thing that came to horror to me was Hollow Man, like when Kevin Bacon played the role. Yeah. I was like, okay, he's a psychopath in that one. That's kind of the premise of the original Invisible Man, that this whatever serum or whatever he's using to turn invisible is taking a toll on his mind, and he's kind of losing it. And, you know, what it what it sort of buys into or kind of plays into is the fact 
the fear of not knowing if someone is in the room with you, observing your most intimate moments and seeing you at your most vulnerable, that there could be someone standing behind you breathing down your neck, you know? See, to us, I think that would be horrifying. But now for kids, <laughs> your, your camera, your phone's always on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, kids. It the reads Patriot your Act. mind, yeah. In 2000, uh, 2001, we did the Patriot Act, so, you know, yeah. <laughs> these things are always on. Yeah, but no, the, the, the Claude Rains version of... of uh, of Invisible Man is outstanding, and and I believe that was Claude Rains' first like major starring role, and uh, they said they cast him because they knew he was going to be invisible most of the film, so they wanted his voice, they wanted his personality because that's what you're going to be hearing throughout the film is is his personality coming through, not necessarily his look. You do see his face, but you know ninety percent of the movie he's invisible or has bandages wrapped around his face. But it's a very good movie and one of the best uh, uh, universal monster movies. Andrew just showed me something. I was just going to ask about this because this is one of those movies that came out in about three weeks later, COVID happened. Mm. And I think it would have been better or bigger if if COVID had him. The Invisible Man 2020 with Elizabeth Moss. It's got a 92 on Rotten Tomatoes. You know what? It did. I remember when that came out. I never saw it, but people yeah. were raving about it. Right, and that's yeah. one of those movies that I didn't know anybody that saw it. Yeah, it said I had it, it had a budget of only seven million, but made like a hundred forty-four million. Yeah, would have made more money if COVID hadn't happened. I gotta check that I, out. I'm I glad you too. brought that up. It just for whatever reason popped in my mind, and I the cat changer. It's yeah. got it's got great reviews, so I'd like to watch it. Yeah, now, there's, a, there's a, the another Invisible Man movie that really tanked at the box office, and it could have been so much better. Do you guys remember a movie called, I think it was called Memoirs of an Invisible Man? Yes. Who starred in it? I, I Chevy Chase. Yeah, there we go. Chevy Chase starred in an Invisible Man movie, and it, I believe it tanked. And I, I think I saw it in the theater, and I never saw it again, and I don't think it did very well. Was it serious? Well, it's Chevy Chase. So it I tried think there was to be dramatic, that, yeah. but Chevy can't do drama. Yeah, yeah. But since you brought up Hollow Man, which came out years later starring Kevin Bacon, the one thing that really bothered me about that particular movie, now think about what if you were granted the powers of invisibility, what would you do with that? And I would have some fun with it, you know? The problem with Hollow Man is that it's not fun. One of the first moments where he turns invisible He rapes a woman. And I'm like, do you have to be invisible to rape a woman? Like, is that the first thing you're going to do if you turn invisible? Let's have some fun with it. Like, prank people and do things that you always wanted to do with that gift. And they just went right to rape. And I'm like, okay, you lost me right at the beginning of this movie. That's the, 90s the effects shot. were amazing. Yes. Like the effects of him, you see his skeleton and his veins and all that stuff was really well done. But it was poorly written. That, you yeah. know, have some fun with it before you go that dark. Now, I think if you establish that, you know, again, whatever serum or whatever they're using to turn invisible, if it's taking a toll on your mind, then you have them go down a path where, you know, he becomes this evil monster. But right. don't go there right <laughs> off the bat. Come on, man. I was just looking up that Chevy Chase movie. Guess who directed that? Afraid to ask. Yes, yes. The the horror director of the last 40... Wes Craven? Was no. Car- Car- Carpen- Carpenter? It was Carpenter. I had no idea. What? I had never That's... heard of this movie in John Carpenter. I had no <laughs> idea John Carpenter directed Yikes. Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Daryl Hannah is the chick in it. Yeah, 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 Ma- yeah. Michael McKean's in it. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Hey, well, you yeah. know, it's got done. a 28 on Rotten Tomatoes. So. 28? Yeah. That's what does enough. Hollow Man have? It probably has a higher score, but I'd be surprised if it was above 50. Because, like I said, it, I just felt it was poor. It was, there was so much potential there, and they just didn't have fun with it. I don't, uh, know, I don't know if he's a universal character, you know, but w- what's the rating yeah, on Yeah, rating on, on Hollow Man. Rating on Hollow Man is coming, coming, yeah. coming up. 26. Yeah, see, that's pretty low. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I want to say Elizabeth Shue. Was that was yeah, directed, Elizabeth Shue, wasn't yeah, yeah. it? That was directed by Paul Verhoeven, who okay. also did. See, it should have been much better than that. He was He's he was great a- at, like, sarcasm and, and satire. Yeah, RoboCop, Total yeah. Recall, Starship Troopers. But this movie basic had none instinct. of that. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. 
Now, now you know what's interesting at, at the end of the Abbott and Costello movie, when they think you know Frankenstein is dead or Frankenstein's monster is dead, and Dracula and werewolf crashed into the uh, sea, um, they think it's all over and they're in this boat, and then you see like a floating cigarette and. He's like, I'm the Invisible Man, and that's Vincent Price uh -huh. voicing the Invisible Man. Well, eventually, they do a movie called Abbott and Costello Meet the Invisible Man, and they don't get Vincent Price to do it, which is a huge missed opportunity. Yeah. And I don't remember who played the Invisible Man. I think he was a, a boxer. The character was like a boxer or something. Hmm. Um, but they missed the opportunity to bring back Vincent Price as the Invisible Man. But they did do Abbott and Costello Meet the Invisible Man. I'll have to revisit that one. Uh, I haven't seen that one in a long time, but... Yeah, the the success of Abbott and Costello meeting Frankenstein led to them meeting all kinds of other movie monsters and killers and ghosts and things a, like that. A horror character that doesn't get their just doesn't get their flowers, as far as I'm concerned, because I don't think they've done a good movie. At least not that I'm aware of. But there could be. I can already see people are like, no, there's one out there. You just don't know how to find it. Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. That's a good one. Yeah, oh, yeah. They, they now I wouldn't be opposed if some like a. Decent director and a good writer were to do that today. Yeah, right. And where the high character interested. is is high, like it's the it's the id, it's the untapped, it's the un, it's the psychopath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The darkness. Yeah. Of the world. Now there have been sort of comedic turns yeah. of uh, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde. Nutty Professor comes to mind. Yep. Uh, you know Jerry Lewis did it first, but Eddie Murphy did it later. Um, and so you know he's suave and cool one moment and goofy and nerdy the other moment. That's definitely a Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, uh, Looney Tunes does a great job. I mean, one a, a forgettable <laughs> movie that's out there, and you know, not everyone makes winners. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Oh gosh, I think I've seen that once when it first came out. Yep, and my God, that was a train wreck. But you talk about the cast, and they had, and they had Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde in it. Van Helsing. They with with the, the character in? with two, in two thousand four. Huh. It opened with that's the character he's hunting. Huh. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah, yeah. And it's just... Uh, Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, the whole werewolf thing is sort of a similar concept where, you know, you're a good person by day and this murderous beast by night. That's sort of Jekyll and Hyde. But, yeah, I would love to see a modern retelling of that particular story. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see all these classic yeah. universal monsters done correctly yeah. uh, in today's theater. And tap into the horror vibe. I can't... Yeah. yeah. Don't go Don't go the Marvel route. Yeah. Don't make it a, a fight, an action movie. Come on. Yeah. I mean, like, there's certain movies, I, you know, when we were talking, when we had our previous ep episode, I watched the... I recently watched The Fog. The, the Fog? Yeah. The one, John, and, that's John Carpenter. Right? Yeah. And there's... Just the way... There's something to be said for the element of it. Salem's Lot. Mm -hmm. the, the HBO Max just... Uh, H Max just released one... Oh, I don't know yeah. what they did. They did you watch it? The, uh, I, it? I did. How was it? It was it was okay. Okay, the original one came on seventy nine. Mm -hmm. It was uh, yeah, a two parter. TV, movie, yep. TV it, was a, it was a two parter, so it's three hours and three minutes long. Yeah, it needed that. Yeah, this one for some reason is an hour and fifty four long. Mm -hmm. You shaved an hour off, so it felt rushed. There were great individual performances. Yeah, the vampires look amazing. Yeah, the cinematography is great in it, but the story suffered in my opinion because. It's it's two hour, just under two hours. Mm -hmm. Give it that extra hour that you wanted. Lord of the Rings is for. I mean, you've had three hours, mo three hour movies before. Just yeah, this could have done, been a three hour movie or what? what another if, forty minutes, a half an hour. Would it, would, would it have worked as like an eight part series? I, that's another thing. That's that's what I'm saying. So many movies today would work so good as an eight part series. That movie sure. Megalopolis, hmm. if he would have took taken the time with it and made it an eight part <laughs> series, characters vanish. It could have been excellent. Yeah, yeah. Did you end up watching it? Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> that's another day. We'll talk about that some other time. That's uh, I, I'm I'm horrified that I saw it. Well, that's not that bad. <laughs> I mean, there I were some good parts. There, there are some good parts, but I get upset when characters vanish. Yeah, like Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, anyway, just irritating. But I mean, but no, Andrew, Andrew's got a. That's a fantastic point. Something like Salem's Lot. You in this day, yes. you, could, you could stretch out because you, you yeah. could explore more of these characters. Go talk to Stephen King. Yeah. Ask him, hey, what do you want to do about? He's an EP. He was an EP on this last thing. I was like, say, hey, Stephen, now, yeah, yeah. what can we add about these characters to flesh out the world a little bit? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, with the time remaining we have on the podcast, uh, are there any other uh, monsters that you feel we need to discuss, either from the Golden Age or from modern uh -huh. era? Uh, what would you think be classified as a 
a classic monster <laughs> must see movie. I'm having a hard time coming up. I mean, I, there there are some you know, there's characters like Freddy Krueger and stuff like that, but I don't know if I necessarily consider those monsters. I have what more thoughts? so well, on the last episode, yeah. Slasher, with those type of guys. Yeah, you say? yeah, yeah, that's more of the slasher category. I have a, yeah. I have a couple, and I'll try to make it quick. One is the zombie. The zombie thing. I know we you know, did. That's George almost like a whole genre it's a, in it's itself. A, it's really like, broad. But if they, yeah. if they did it, and we were talking about stuff that should have been a series, World War Z. Yeah. Ever get a chance to read the book or listen yes. to the audio thing? Yeah. There's no. some, there's something called yeah. uh, Brad Pitt action movie that happens to have the same title, which is fine. <laughs> but if you just think of it as Brad Pitt action movie, it, it, it's entertaining. Yeah. It's it on needs an Z. HBO Max series. eight part series. It, 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 it would, would benefit so much. If they did, if they did that as a series, it would be, it would put. Walking Dead would be a distant second. Yeah, and I love Walking Dead. Yeah, the way yeah. It came out. It, Walking because what they did, what Max Brooks did, that's amazing. And the other stuff that I'm talking about, I think the only successful franchise that comes to mind, the Conjuring franchise, where it's just supernatural. Yeah, there's like, another thing, Ghost Story. I mean, we could do a whole podcast. Yeah, like on the Ghost Omen, stories. The Exorcist. I mean, there was a movie I loved in uh, 1980. Yeah. I think it was The Changeling, which is one of my favorite ghost stories. The uh, thing, the others with Nicole Kidman. That's yeah, that a was great good. ghost story. That was good. Yeah, I, we could spend a whole Six hour cents. on that stuff. So, yeah, yeah, you know what? I, I got some stuff to say next episode. <laughs> Man, yeah, we can bring those up next episode. That's a good point. Now, you mentioned a movie earlier. It, it's in a way, it's a monster movie, but it's not something I necessarily would just watch come October. Uh, you mentioned King Kong. Yeah, and it has a lot of elements that a lot of these other movies have, where it's a misunderstood beast that's dragged out of its element and brought to New York and goes on a rampage. Um, and it's, it's kind of a love story. It's, uh, it kind of borrows from the shape of water a little bit where there's kind of a love between King Kong and, and, um, Fay Ray or, uh, you know, whatever the female character's name, uh, Peter Jackson's version. I, I don't know how you guys feel about the Peter Jackson version of King Kong, but I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. I saw I saw in the theater and I liked it. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Naomi Watts is in there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's yeah. in it. Yeah. It was yeah. heartbreaking. I was. I, I, really I almost. Was. Uh, very. I'm glad you brought. That was a very few moments when I saw that, especially when they're in Central Park, and they're, they're he's just playing in the snow, and like there was that moment in there. I was like, man, this is so messed up. Yeah. Like, I just felt bad for him. Yeah, yeah. I felt bad he's for taken Kong. away from his home. Yeah. Yeah, and you know the 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 original King Kong done at RKO. You know all those years ago. Uh, it was, what a marvel that must have been. The only the only gripe I have about the original King Kong is I guess they didn't foresee this, but there was a metal armature of King Kong, and then they covered it with like a rubber or something, and then they put like real fur or whatever on the outside, and they didn't realize until they started doing the stop motion animation that the fingerprints of the animators would appear on the model as they manipulated it. So you see like these fingerprints ripple on the model. And at some point they were like, Oh no, like we're going to have to redo all of this. And, and, and somebody, an executive said, screw it. We're going to just live with it. So they kind of live with it and it's a little distracting, but they did some really amazing things. Like there's a scene where the human actors are like in this cave in this cliff and King Kong's trying to reach for them. And they're on screen at the same time, this miniature animated King Kong and the live actors. And I'm like, okay, how did they pull that off? I yeah. couldn't, like, figure it out. In the 30s. And here's what I found out, that they recorded, they filmed the actors and then played it back, like, on a screen. But instead of just playing it back in real time, every time they would move King Kong a little bit, they would advance that film a frame. And then they'd move King Kong and advance the film. Oh and when they God. played it back, the actors were moving in real time and King Kong was moving along with them. And I'm like, come on, this is this is early in the history of cinema. That was These in the guys 30s. they figured that yeah, out. That's like, amazing. They were like, How are we gonna do this? And I would have never have thought of that. So the guys who did King Kong were just geniuses that here you have this, you know, silly little stop motion puppet that elicits real emotions and you really care about this thing and, and you feel sad at the end spoiler alert um but yeah it was really a, a marvel of cinema in the early early days of, i think howard film. was it it's also because the score plays a big thing and howard shore's score for uh, peter jackson's king kong mm -hmm. that was just, i you know like it's like that very melancholy 
Uh, it was uh, like I said, I, I enjoyed. Of course, Peter, Peter has his moments where he has to have like the brontosaurus run. That's, oh yeah, it's like an absurd. I'm like, why is this scene well, here? They, they stole a page from Jurassic Park. I mean, yeah. they had to. Oh, well, we got to get the kids in the theaters. So let's throw some dinosaurs in yeah, there, and that's just, it's fairly obvious that that's what they were doing. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I I loved it, and, and then and the New York scenes were stunning. The New York scenes, but then that that creepy scene when they fell off the log and they're down in the pit, in in the rift. Oh, oh yeah. Oh my God. I uh, that. Even even for someone like me, I'm like, oh, I've seen all the Indiana Jones movies, so yeah. I don't really get creeped out. But I was watching them like, oh, this is really creepy. Yeah. Now we have to bring up the 1980 or 79 version of King Kong, which uh, it's hard to go back and watch now because King Kong scales the World Trade Center. <laughs> um, that one is kind of hard to watch. I remember when it came out. I was a kid when it came out, basically oh, a just teenager. Going. And, and, yeah, and, you know, I remember it was a big deal. It was marketed. There were toys and posters and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I recently revisited it, and it was really hard to watch. The, the King Kong, they built, like, full-size giant versions yeah, of King Kong. And, and uh, it's there's a scene where he's, like, you know, holding the uh, – what's the actress's name? That, uh, Jessica Lang. Jessica Lang. He's like holding her, and this giant face is like coming into the camera with this creepy smile and big eyes. And I'm like, yikes. And it does not hold up today. And there's good reason why it's not necessarily considered a classic like the original or even the Peter Jackson version. The, the 81, the, the, the 78, 79, whenever it came out. I mean, Jeff Bridges is in it, and he's pretty yeah. good in it. Um, but it, it just does not hold up. I. I would not revisit it out of curiosity and go, oh, well, let's let's see how King Kong holds It's one of those movies it. where you, you go back and you watch it for the camp factor. Yeah, and it was pretty campy. Yeah, yeah. and the effects just weren't quite where they needed to be yet. A movie that uh, we, we should mention that, you know, belongs in horror because even though it's monster-ish, Jaws. Oh, sure. Because that's... Yeah, the, the unknown, you know. I, I think we've talked about it before, but, um, you know, the fact that the mechanical shark failed it wasn't working most of the time so steel steven spielberg was forced to just suggest that it was under the water you know that worked in favor of jaws and made it one of the scariest movies you know ever made to the point where people were afraid to go into the water uh it just worked so well um the unseen fear beneath the surface of the water and see now this is an interesting question that came out in 77 or 75 75 yeah 75 yeah. so I'm sure it's been shown in all sorts of film classes. And so these Hollywood executives, if they've never studied film, which I don't know why you're Hollywood executive then, and all these directors, less is more. Right. If you let the audience, you know, film their their imagination of the audience is infinitely more scary than whatever you can throw with some yeah. computer effects on there. But they keep doing it. Well, you know what? I, over Fourth of July weekend this year, I watched Jaws 2 for the first time in a long time. And that was a huge phenomenon when it came out because Jaws was so big, people were itching for a sequel. And basically the director that they hired who did not get along with Roy Scheider or anything, he said, you know what? We've seen the shark in the first movie, so we're just going to show him right off the bat. And it just, like you said, it doesn't yeah. work. And if you were to watch Jaws 2, what it reminds me of is it sort of takes a page from like the Friday the 13th movies and the slasher flicks of the '80s, because it's a they introduce a bunch of new teenage characters who get you know picked off one by one by the shark, and I'm like, this has just turned into a slasher version of what was a classic horror film is now a shark slasher film, and it does it doesn't really hold up. And Roy Scheider did not want to be there, so he doesn't really make the effort. And, and Universal did it again. Had they yeah. waited, had they given Stephen time, he would have come and done it. Yeah. He had an idea. He had a story. I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. We'll never know. And Roy Scheider was committed to a second picture, and they could have waited for Richard Dreyfus. Yeah. The best thing about Jaws 2 is the movie poster. The The first Jaws movie uh, poster is such a classic. We got the nude girl swimming at the top of the poster, and the shark is coming up from beneath the surface. The second one, they have a girl in a bikini on water skis, and the shark is coming up behind her. That's the best thing about the movie. I'm yeah. like, that's a really effective poster, but the movie just didn't hold up. So yeah, because again, Universal can't seem to get it together. All right, guys, I think it's uh, time to wrap up. That puts us right sure. at the 90 minute mark. Uh, that was a fun conversation, and 
it's always great watching the old Universal horror movies uh, this time of the year. And yeah, I think this weekend I'm going to watch a few more. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. Plus some of the suggestions that you guys made. So, all right, great chatting with you. Thanks for listening. Good night, everybody. Good night. We'll see you. Come to the movies. Watch Charlie Chaplin and put some sunshine into your day. Forget the hard times. Come to the movies and try to laugh your troubles away.